Welcome to the next episode of Music Design. Continuing in the Souls series, we'll be taking a look at Dark Souls 2 and its hub world theme, Majula. Dark Souls 2 was primarily composed by Matori Sakuraba, with some help by Yuka Kitamura, who would continue to write music for From Software's upcoming games such as Dark Souls 3, Sekiro, and Elden Ring. Just like in Dark Souls 1, this desolate town's atmosphere is meant to evoke a calming and reflective effect on the listener. Let's look at how this was accomplished. As you'll notice first off, there's a surprisingly few number of instruments in Majula. Also similar to Firelink Shrine from Dark Souls 1 is the massive amount of space throughout the whole song. There are passages, especially at the beginning, where the music is almost at complete silence. We'll cover why this is important later on. The song track length is at a decent 3 minutes and 4 seconds before the loop point. The Celesta will be the primary featured instrument in Majula. I combined two different Celesta instruments in order to achieve this vibey sound. You'll notice that it sounds very soft. This can be achieved by playing the Celesta near the bottom of the velocity as well as placing an EQ to shelve off the high end. The violins will fade in and out throughout the tune in this eerie tone. They're actually playing in an articulation called flagellate. This is when the violinist lightly touches the string of their violin to produce a harmonic sound. Sakuraba chooses to use this all the way throughout the song to evoke creepiness and isolation. The brass comes in two forms. At the start of section 2, they'll emit these staccato notes. And then in the last section, they'll sustain longer notes. The harp will be featured in the halfway point of the song, taking over as lead melody. Finally, the atmospheric sounds at the end bring in some horror elements, which we'll cover shortly. In section 1, Sakuraba starts very minimally, yet potently, with the simple Celesta. This first chord is played like an open A chord, an octave A with E in the middle, but moves that top A up to B to form an A sus2. This chord immediately evokes a serious atmosphere. It's followed up by an F major 7th sus, again played in an open spacing. Now look at how long the space is after this chord. It's a whole two measures long just sustaining this one chord. The reason why Sakuraba chooses to play silence like this is because he wants to create an isolating feeling. Music that has many moving parts that continuously play feels alive and energetic. With a piece like Majula, the opposite effect is desired. The composer and the game designers want you to feel dark and alone while in this town. After that long break, the flagellate strings are introduced slowly, sustaining only one note. Again, this feels very cold and distant. On the repeat of the phrase in the Celesta, another string note is added to increase the intensity of the strings a little. This will descend note by note down. Section 2 opens with an ominous and unexpected brass staccato note blaring out a low E note. The strings are also cut out here to bring more attention to both the Celesta and the Brass before they join back in later on. The Celesta will repeat its phrase four times while also adding these top higher notes that it plucks on.
how I got this brass sound was combining three different instruments together from Metropolis Arc. The first was a tuba, and then a contrabassoon, and then another tuba stacked on top. And you can see they're all on the staccato articulation. All that was left to do was pluck a few E notes. In the second half of section 2, the Celesta will roll up these very unique chords. If we play them slowly, they sound mysterious and atonal. This will repeat two more times in like manner. And then in this last measure, Sakuraba just plays two dissonant notes, the E and the F. Since they're only a half step apart, they feel like they vibrate together. The violins are fairly simple, but there's one thing I want to point out. When I open up the automation tabs here, notice the green channel. That is when I fade in the violins. And I do this because without it, the strings would play instantly. But I want a slow fade in effect. Let's listen to both sections 1 and 2. The fun continues while we suddenly switch to the harp in this section. This harp comes from the Celtic Era Library, which has a very soft tone when played in its lower velocities. The following section is very much atonal, as we'll repeat this opening phrase the exact same way but moving down each key. Halfway through, the Celesta and violins are introduced again for a brief moment before the harp joins in too. The harp pattern remains mostly the same except that it adds higher notes to the pattern. This harkens back to when the Celesta added those higher notes in its pattern too. Notice the looseness of these higher notes in the harp. When the last measure arrives, the harp will begin a run on C major. While this may look a bit complicated, all it does is use the notes of C major, essentially all the white notes, until reaching the top G. Right at that G is the next section. The Celesta returns with a melancholic A minor 7 over E chord. It'll strike the same chord three more times, sounding almost like a bell.
In the second half, it'll change to a happier D sus4. Repeating that three times as well. Following another quick run up the C major scale in the harp, every single instrument joins in this last section of the song. This luster sounds beautiful by itself. The violins will mostly hold on two notes before transitioning to the next chord halfway through. These white hills you see are the expression automation, which controls how intense the strings will sound. The higher the hills, the more intense the violins. Brass is even more simple, holding on the simple A note, but descending one note down to G. If we look at the harp, it'll change its function in this section. Before it served as a primary lead instrument, here it'll pluck eighth notes in the scale of A minor. This chord outlines and A sus4. The last interesting feature of Majula is the frightening atmosphere during the last part of the song. The type of feeling is meant to evoke that of sudden intensity and fear. I combine two different atmospheric sounds. This is the first one. And this is the second. I push the volume of both of them right at the end to act as almost a riser before the loop point. With everything in mind, let's take a listen from section 3. From Software certainly chose the right composer in Matoi Sakuraba, as he provided a deeply unique and atmospheric soundtrack to Dark Souls 2. Filled with intense boss battle music and complemented also with softer, atmospheric pieces like Majula. 
I would like to personally thank all the people on Patreon who have made music design possible, including Kevin Huin, Sam Hanley, Manish Corona, Dennis Maus, Justin Chin, and Alan Brown. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you all in the next episode of Music Design Spotlighting Dark Souls 3.